I'm so excited about today's guest. Today we're talking to Nancy Thayer, one of my all-time favorite novelists. Nancy is the author of 35 novels, including Summer Love, Family Reunion, and Nantucket Christmas and the Hot Flash Club. Her books are about families, friendship, and the beautiful island of Nantucket where she has lived for 39 years with her husband and their spoiled cat. Nancy talks to us about how she found herself in her writing, all of her journeys around the world, and how she really puts herself within each one of her characters. We hope you enjoy. Well, Nancy, we are so excited to have you today. Um, why don't you dive in? Because you have such a like an interesting story, and obviously, we read all of your books, and we look forward to them every year. Um, you know, would love to kind of hear. You know, the way that we kick this off is um, we love to kind of hear the backstory. We love to hear your story of how you got into writing. You know, what writing has done for you, how you ground yourself in writing, things along those lines. So, I'm going to kind of leave that as an open-ended question for you. I always wanted to write. I grew up in Kansas, um, and we always went to the library every Saturday. And as a child, I remember going in. I loved to read. My mother read. My father read. We just we were big readers, and I could get a pile of books to take home from the library just with a library card. I remember that. I remember going and taking my library card. And then in the summer, we would have like reading contests. And if we read everything, I don't know what we got, maybe a pencil. I don't know. But I always read and I always wanted to write. That's what I wanted to do. And I wrote short stories, very short stories, when I was in sixth grade. Um, and my teacher had me read them aloud to the class on Friday afternoon, just before the bell rang. And I loved that. I, I don't remember being nervous about it. I had really good stories. They were probably all copied from, um, what is that? The, the box with children? No, the box car children. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. So... Then I went to college at Wichita U, and then I eloped with my husband, who was 36 when I was 20, and he was my psychology professor. And um, if Me Too had been around, then this wouldn't have happened. My parents did not like him. He'd been divorced twice. He was 16 years older. But I thought it was glamorous. I thought it was exciting. So he taught at UMKC. We lived there. I got a master's, a bachelor's and a master's. And we traveled a lot. And so I got to live in a lot of cities. I lived in Paris. I lived in Amsterdam. And um, as the years went along, we had two children, but we were not happy in our marriage, and I really wanted to get divorced. And the first novel I wrote was called A Faithful Woman, about a woman who wanted to leave her husband. And somebody gave me the name of an agent who was Julian Bach, who was the most glamorous, elegant, New York City. Oh, just, he was Sir Edmund Hillary's agent. He was like totally amazing. And he liked the book, A Faithful Woman, but no publisher bought it. And then I had to go to Helsinki with my husband and two kids. And um, he, my husband had a Fulbright, and so he was teaching all the time. I lived in a fourth floor concrete walk up with no elevator on an island called Kulasari, which is a suburb of Helsinki. I didn't have any friends. My children didn't have any friends. We didn't have a television or a radio or a record player or toys. Oh. And there was somebody called the Voice Tati, which was the park lady. So I could leave them there in the morning. And somehow in the afternoon, I would make the kids 
go in their room, they shared a room, Let's say take a nap. I don't care what they did. They couldn't hurt themselves. They had to stay in that room. And I wrote the first six chapters of my novel, Stepping. I wrote by hand in these little notebooks. And um, I think the first sentence was something like, I'm sitting in a in the suburb of Helsinki, Kulasari, and this is how I got here. Stepping was very autobiographical. Then I got back to the United States. Um, my husband and I got a divorce, which was wonderful. And um, I ended up living in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And um, my first novel, Stepping, was accepted by Doubleday. And um, that was, it was accepted in 1978 for $10,000. Wow. And, uh, and I got to go into New York. It's very close to Williamstown. Much nicer, big cool aside. Although I'm sure it's lovely now. I don't want to insult anybody. Um, but um, I went into New York, I had an agent who was Julian Bach, and he would take me to the Four Seasons for lunch, and he would have three martinis for lunch. And um, anyway, I can, I, I can say that I was with Julian as an agent for many years, and I was very sad when he retired. Um, because he represented sort of my version of a British literary agent. And um, I, in that time, and for about 20 years, I moved publishing houses. I started at Doubleday, and they published my first three books. But my agent, asked me to go to Morrow because I would make more money. So I got there, I published one book, and then I had wanted to work with an editor named Christina, I can't remember her last name. So I moved to Charles Scribner's and Sons, which you can imagine for a writer was like Charles Scribner's and Sons because there had been a man named Charles Scribner sums. Um, so I moved there, but as soon as I moved there to be with Christina, Macmillan bought Scribner's. This is relevant to anybody who wants to write. Um, and Christina went back to England. And I pu published two books, I think, with um, Scribner's. And then I went to St. Martin's Press. Mm -hmm. And then about maybe 20 years ago, um, a friend of mine on the island named Laura Simon had, a, had an agent named Meg Rooley. And I was working with an agent at that point who had been in Julian's office. And Laura kept saying, you've got to talk to Meg. You've got to talk to Meg. So I called her and I said, I want to write a book called The Hot Flash Club because that was, the, that was what I wanted to write about. And I'm going to interrupt myself here because the important thing to me and the important thing I feel like I've done is to write many books about what I call ordinary women, normal women. When I got my master's at UMKC, and I loved my teachers, I loved being there, but I realized I had gotten a bachelor's and a master's without ever having read a book by a woman. They didn't have me read Emily Dickinson or Willa Cather or Virginia Woolf. And I thought of all the men's books I read about yeah. bullfighting or war. And I thought, I want to write 
about what it's like just to be a normal woman. And, and I kept doing that because I kept realizing it's really hard. It's really hard to be what we call a normal woman. It's really hard to have children. It's yeah. really hard to have stepchildren. Um, and there are times when your child is sick or hurt, when I feel like you suffer as much as if you were crawling on your belly in a trench in war. It's, and you don't have any more uh, control of what's going to happen in that. So that has always been my, my steady aim and goal in light in life to write about normal women. You know, your story is just because obviously I'm a huge fan. You know, I think that's one of the reasons you con you constantly come back to your stories because they are about women reinventing themselves or finding themselves in a lovely place in, N in Nantucket. <laughs> it's, it, it's a dream. My husband is a little bit bitter about it. <laughs> but, um, you know, they're so down to earth. They're so ordinary, but it's, it's all about taking those steps to reinvention or finding one's voice or finding a new relationship or finding yourself, you know, and that's something that's very relatable because I think every woman goes through it no matter what phase of life they're in. Your women are always, uh, always have bravery. They always, you know, I just, you know, the book that, you know, from this summer reading about Heather and you know how relatable that is to where I am in my life, but like, how, I mean, even it seems normal. I mean, it seems like an average thing that like she's getting divorced. And so she moves into a little house. And I'm like, oh my God, that's the brave, that is such a brave move. And I think so many women look at those, what you're, you know, you're saying it is ordinary things that we as women do, but they really are big, brave moves. It was brave of you to get divorced and to move on and to do the things that was brave of you to change publishers. That is, you know, there's so much so scary. I mean, it's scary to do those things. It is. It's, it's, it's frightening to have children, first of all. I mean, right. even to give birth, um, which is always a new experience, no matter how many times you've read about it or done it. And then to care for this child, this baby, I found that that's where I needed so much courage mm -hmm. because I was alone in different countries with this baby and um, I didn't know what I was doing. I don't think, I don't think it's easy. I think even if you've read all the books and your, uh, your sister has had 10 babies, you still have your own experience to go right. through and marriage and divorce. Um, it was very easy for me to get divorced because, like many, many people, um, my husband was dissatisfied with me and he was having an affair with my best friend. So I think that happens a lot. And um, so, and he also had no interest in children. Um, and that's been sadness for my children. And um, he didn't care about his children who were my stepchildren. And I was very fortunate uh, to be able to love the oldest girl. I liked the younger girl, but the oldest girl, who was 11 years younger than I was, or no, I think she was nine years younger. We were very close and we've kept in touch over the years. She has come to Nantucket to meet Charlie and to be in our house and to see the island. And, um, and my ex-husband really moved on to a new wife and, and was, um, I think he was very happy and my Two children have grown now, and I think they're they're very happy in their lives. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. It's it's so interesting because you put it, it sounds like even just you telling the story that you put a lot of your experiences in all of your books. 
you know, in terms of the women and what they're going through, whether it's relationships, whether it's children, whether it's husbands and so new relationships, things along those lines. It's something you definitely apply forward and put that vulnerability in there. In terms of Helsinki, um, I know when, um, when you were there, you, you know, it, it's come up that you spent a lot of time writing and that was really your grounding force. And that's where you found a lot of your voice. Can you talk a little bit about that? Up until then, I had published short stories in literary reviews. And I always sent stories to Red Book Magazine because that used to be my mother took it. It would come in the mail. She was gone. We didn't see her <laughs> the rest of the day. And my, my, my goal and desire was to be published in the magazine. But I did get published in university reviews. And, and that, that was amazing to me. It was wonderful. And then um, I sent a short story to a Canadian woman's review. I think it was just called We. I can't remember. That's awful that I can't remember. But this was like 48 years ago. And I sent them a short story. Um, and then uh, I had my second child, my daughter, and I drove in, at that point we were living on the farm, I drove in to the mailbox, took out the mail, and there was a check from the magazine for $50. I can remember standing there, I can remember thinking, I can, I can really do this, I can, and I wasn't thinking about the money, but I was thinking about the value, the the feeling of I am worthy. And if you're going to write and put yourself out there, no matter where you come from or who your contacts are, when you get your story published and a check for $50 from a woman's magazine, any magazine, then, then you have the sense of I'm worthy. I'm all the crazy stuff I'm doing, writing and rewriting and tearing things up and ignoring my children. It's it's good. It's all worthwhile. Um, so I had written a lot and had things published. And when I was in Helsinki, um, I also didn't have any books. And um, I didn't have any friends. <laughs> I spent a lot of time I don't know, chasing my children around. How long were you there, Nancy? Just six months. Okay. Yeah, yeah that was long enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just, it's not that it was Helsinki and cold and it was, it was hard to go up the stairs or go down the stairs with my four-year-old and my two-year-old and a stroller and a bag for groceries and walk to the grocery store every day because the refrigerator was about this big. That's how they were. And I would walk with these little children to the grocery store and maybe they would find things to play with because kids are good at that age. They can find a rock and play with it. And then we would go back up the stairs um, and then finally the time would come uh, when I could sit down and write. And I've never written so fast or so much from my heart or so so bravely. I, was, I really was writing about, what I was writing about was a stepmother, but a woman who also wanted, and this was in... Um, 78 when I wrote this, the woman wants to be a mother and a wife, and she wants to teach English in college. That's what Zelda wanted. And that, compared to what women have today, that seems like such an innocent desire to teach English in college. But in fact, I had been told by professors that no woman could ever teach English literature in college. I should 
get a degree in education so I could teach in high school. All these things were in my life and um, in stepping, Zelda has a dilemma because she's supposed to do something with her husband but she wants to go hear a talk by an important woman. I don't even get the important woman in name. Um, and I don't think she gets to go, I can't remember. There was a lot of, of shaking off my fears and my, um, my sense of, of failure, of not belonging as a writer. I did not take a writer's workshop, even though I was at the, we lived for a while in, in Iowa City, and um, my husband taught at the University of Iowa, and I took a course from a writer named Cordy Bryan, C.D.D. Bryan, who was wonderful, and I wrote a short story about my grandfather, and Cordy wrote on the top, you're a real writer. And I sent that story to the University of Tulsa, a literary journal, and they published it. So all of this, all of this trying and wanting and longing, and then maybe meeting at the University of, of Iowa, for example, I met William Price Fox, who had had books published novels, not textbooks, novels. And I remember I was I was just I just wanted him to talk and tell me how to do it. But I think when I was in Helsinki I wanted to do this so desperately. I wanted to write about this woman. Um, I had written a letter to my friend saying this is before I wrote Stepping, but while I was in Helsinki. Um, I wrote to her saying, you have accomplished so much in life. You have three children, and I don't know, she worked for a real estate company or something, but I, I said, I'm really envious because you have achieved these things. And my husband saw the letter and said, you have to throw it away, you can't. You can't let anybody know that you think that your life is wonderful because you're married to me. So your life must be wonderful. Um, so there was all of this. There was, I loved my children. I loved my stepchildren. One, not so much. Um, <laughs> I, re I, I wrote this book. And this novel, Stepping, was condensed in Red Book magazine. It sold in a lot of countries. I know. <laughs> Big Red Book. It's like I remember my mom getting Red Book. So yeah. I'm like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. no, I don't even know if Red Book is still published. I don't think it's. I don't think it's a magazine anymore. It might be yeah. online. Oh, yeah. online. It's Wait, I have to know. Did you send the letter, or did you not send the letter? I didn't send. The letter. Uh. I didn't send the letter. I, I, I dedicated the book to my husband, and it went to Lee, L-E-E -E dot, dot, dot. And I don't know why I put that there, except I wasn't happy dedicating it to him, but I knew if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to get divorced, have custody of the children. It was, okay. there was a lot of negotiation going on. It's a lot of politicking in a marriage. In terms of, you know, when you were talking earlier just about hopping publishers, why did you hop so many, like, what was it about finding the right publisher for you? It's like, I'm not a writer, so I'm aspiring someday, but, um, you know, what goes into finding a publisher? You know, what is, is it about the personality? Is it about how they understand your voice? You know, changing publishers so many times you know, obviously there's a drive there. Well, I've been writing for 40 years. Yeah. So that's one reason I've changed publishers. 
a lot of my editors got married or moved okay. from one publishing house to another publishing house. My agent, Julian, actually made the decisions for me because okay. he always told me that I walked a razor's edge between being literary and being commercial. Mm -hmm. And when I was divorced, I wanted to be commercial because I, I was raising my children. Um, but I don't think I ever wasn't literary, and I really don't like that divide in the publishing world. Like, you can be really literary, or you can be really commercial, but some people do manage to do both. Yeah. So after Julian left, I was with another agent who I liked very much, but um, she, didn't, she and I didn't really match up. And okay. I was at a couple of publishing houses where, uh, for example, when I was with um, Pam Dorman at, uh, it was, <laughs> I'm trying to remember the name. She's this fabulous, fabulous editor. But we didn't, we just didn't click. And I liked her, she liked me, but she, had offered on my book because she thought there was something I could write or a way in which I wrote. And I got a letter from one of the vice presidents of St. Martin's Press saying they'd really love to have me there. So I went there and um, I, I really, I felt happy there, I think for two or three books. But okay. When I called, um, when I called Meg Ruley, um and told her the title of, of the Hot Flash Club, and she <laughs> laughed, and she called Linda Merrill at Valentine, I I knew I knew I was connected with a place I wanted to be, and I stayed with Valentine maybe 15 years, I, I, okay. many, many books. And I and Linda left, she had children. And um, so I've been with Shauna Summers for, oh, 10 years maybe. Yeah. And she's so different from me. She's a New Yorker, um, she's full of energy, and, and yet she's a, she's a wonderful, editor. She doesn't have to be just like me right. to, to edit. And I think editing and writing are two very different strengths. There weren't a lot of books around being step parents. You know, right. I would say even today, mm -hmm. there's not, you know, I'm, I've yeah. said it on a, a podcast or two before, you know, and I've talked to Gretchen quite a bit, you know, it's like one of my dreams is to write children's books around step parents because step parents mm -hmm. don't have to be wicked or evil. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and kids are still given that narrative, you know, but when you even look at adults, step parenting is something that's still not a topic that's out there. So when you wrote the book, you know, what was, what was the reaction? What was, you know, what was your expectation? It's like, that was kind of, I would say an off topic at the time. Yeah. New, new territory. Yeah. I received so many letters from women who had read the condensed novel in Red Book magazine. Yeah. Piles of letters. I still have them somewhere in my storage unit because they were saying, this is how I feel about my stepchildren. This is how I feel about what I'm trying to do. And some women wrote and said, how dare you say that you don't love your stepchildren? Um, and some people wrote saying, thank you for saying you don't love your stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, because it's, it's a rough time. Yeah. And I've, I felt with all it sold in many other countries, I felt like, I felt like that was actually, I remember Doubleday brought me down to a seminar in some hotel ballroom yeah. with, um, there was a psychologist or a psychiatrist who was talking about divorce and maybe somebody who'd written a 
textbook or a self-help book about divorce and me. And I, it was the first time I ever spoke in public. And writers usually work alone and like to be alone. Um, and that was, that room was full. It was absolutely yeah. full of people who, and I still, um, I, I mean, it's still going on. It's a role that's undefined. It's a role that's, it, it's, there's no right way, right? There's no right relationship when you're a step parent. Of, they're not your kids, but you can love them. You can not feel connected to them depending on their age and when you come into their lives. And it's, it's, some, it's an evolving relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, it can't be put into a box. It's not like, here's my husband. You love them. Here's your kid. You love them. It's... <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. I, was, I was living in Williamstown and um, my third novel had just come out and a good friend had moved to Nantucket and she said, you have to come see me. And this is going back to step parenting. This is getting to step parenting. <laughs> the bridge. Um, yes. So I, I came to Nantucket because Dinah said, if you come, you can deduct your travel as, as writing expenses. So I came <laughs> and she said, I'll have Charlie, her friend Charlie, interview you. And then that will be your, your uh, reason for coming to the island. And I met Charlie and um, we fell in love. We got married two years later. That's amazing. And he became a step parent. Um, and we had talked a lot about bringing the kids to this new environment. Mm. Uh, Nantucket in the 80s was very different yeah. from the way it is now. It, the high school had no drama, no music, one sport, football, um, not soccer, not lacrosse, not swimming. And over the years, the swimming pool was built at the high school, and there was an ice rink built, and the Nantucket Music Society, uh, MCMC, teaches children whatever, piano, whatever. So things have really changed. But back then, back then, um, we still had so many power outages because I don't even remember how our electricity came, but finally they put in an underwater cable. Mm. So we have all this lovely electricity. <laughs> and Charlie is seven years younger than I am, and he hadn't been married before, and he's an only child, and his mother was an only child, and his father was an only child. Oh my God. So, um, when we first got married, we agreed that he wouldn't do any of the discipline because I didn't want them to hate him immediately. Um, I know how hard it is to um, to discipline kids, even your own kids. And then as we went along, especially when my daughter Sam, our daughter Sam, was a teenager, a young teenager, Charlie stepped in with the discipline because, <laughs> because Sam would be dating. A, well, she, Sam dated a guy older than she was. I mean, he was 18, she was 13. He was handsome. I thought he was wonderful. He was handsome. He made good grades. Charlie said he's too old. Um, so that was really good to have him involved. And he has, I think he would say, having the stepchildren, and, and he calls them his children now, that they have added immeasurably to his life. I think it was very hard for the first two years because, because I write any 
confrontation I have or any kind of criticism comes either on the telephone or in the mail or the email. And when Josh and Charlie would argue about something, I did a lot of jumping in between and saying, who wants some hot chocolate? And <laughs> just wanted me to go away because that's what men do. Well, that's what women do too. And I, I think he's been a wonderful stepfather, but I'll tell you, we now have grandchildren, and he's a fabulous grandfather. So oh, it's, it's easy to be a That's grandfather. a whole different dynamic, right? <laughs> you know, even reading your books um, and you moving to Nantucket in the 80s and, and what that looked like, it's like your books are an ode, there's like an ode to Nantucket. It's a, you have a romance with Nantucket within your books. It's, you know, you magically transport your readers to this magical island. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, I, see, I'm, I'm not even kidding how much my husband's like, we're not going to Nantucket. We're fine. <laughs> we're not moving to Nantucket. We're not. Um, but was my friend, Charlie, I, was Charlie from there? Had he, did he live there year round? Uh, we've lived here year round. He grew up in Boston. Okay. Uh, okay. His grandparents came here in the summer. His mother came here in the summer. And uh, he never wants to live anywhere else. And magical. Now I don't want to live anywhere else. I was I've really always been in love with England and I've done a lot of of traveling in England and Scotland and Wales. Um but I'm so glad to come here. I, I love it here. I love I love the island. It's beautiful. It's nourishing. It's, it gives you time to contemplate, and, it, and the ocean gives you, it gives me, gives everyone, like electric ions that make you think, I can do this, I can do this. <laughs> um, and at the same time, Nantucket is a small town, and it really is a small town. It's like a tic-tac-toe grid of churches and the post office and the library, and um, a lot of wonderful stories. So you should come. You should move here. If you can my, work online. My my goal is to come out there for the Christmas like the Christmas mart and the Christmas stroll. That's like a dream of mine. Yeah, that's wonderful. It is so off sea like off season, not the summer crowd. And it's cheaper off season. Come in September or October and it's wonderful, but it's not as expensive. There, there's no lack of stories for this little uh, this little community, and like you said, it, it it is a small town, but there's you're never running out of stories. No, no, but I think that's because there are families here, and that's because there are friends here, and and there is something special. I, my good friend Charlotte, who was director of the library for a while, <clears throat> was divorced. And she met her husband, her second husband here. They've been married for, I don't know, 15 years. They met because she had, she was introducing a lecture and he came to the lecture and they met. There are so many stories like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think it's amazing to me because it's really, in the summer, it's a big place. Now we have maybe 50,000 people. But still, there's this romance going on. And I think that's one of the reasons people come here. You've had so many people fall in love with an island that they've never been to. <laughs> right? The houses. I mean, we can picture everything. We picture where we walk. We picture the stores and the restaurants and where everyone sits when they go to the restaurants. It's so visual that it's, uh, that it's yeah, it's just, it's amazing. Oh, so in terms of like, in terms of what you're writing next, mm -hmm. can you give us a little bit of a sneak peek on in terms of the storyline and what we can expect? Yes, I can. Um, my book that's coming out next May, 2024, is called "The Summer We Started Over," and it's about a family, a father, and two grown daughters. And it's from the point of view of Eddie, 
who was named after Edmund St. Vincent Millay, and Barrett, who was named after Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So they have an eccentric father, and they have a tragedy happen when they're in Williamstown. So the father just moves them to Nantucket to a farm because he found a big farmhouse. And there are farms on Nantucket. And um, so he sort of upends his daughter's lives and moves to Nantucket. And Eddie, the oldest daughter, goes to New York because she loves books. And she works for a romance writer named Dinah Lavender. And I don't know if you know about Barbara Cartman, who was a, a British romance writer, but she was like false eyelashes, big jewels. She was fabulous. And she, I mean, Princess Diana loved Barbara Cartman. The Queen Mother was a friend of, of Barbara Cartman. A lot of information I have about the British family. Um, <laughs> but but Barbara Cartman had always wanted to write about a writer like her, only in America. And Dinah Lavender is um, the romance writer who Eddie goes to New York and works for. Um, and then all sorts of things happened in one summer. Um, the book Barn begins um, and there's a lot of romance, but there's also a lot of finding their place in the world, um, which sometimes takes a while to do. I love the theme that Nantucket, and you've even said it in your own story, that Nantucket gives gives everyone the time to do that. I see, I see that in your stories where there's a lot of taking the time to walk taking the time to, and it sounds like in the story, just taking the time to kind of get out of your normal rat race life, wherever that may be, and that it, the, the island kind of affords that for you. I love that theme that seems to be true for yourself and through all of your stories. Well, I do walk a lot. In fact, when I'm writing, if I can't get going, I'll go for a walk. The mind is so strange because it will work when you're walking. I'm not the only writer who says this. I'll, I'll go for a walk or I, when I go to sleep at night, just as I'm lying down, just almost asleep, my mind will say, Henry has to buy that house and I'll have to get up and well now <laughs> I just take my phone and talk into it. But I don't know why my mind likes to do that, except that it does. Um, I walk, I walk a lot. I, I like walking Surfside, which is on the ocean side. Mm. And I like, I like it in winter when the waves are really big. And most people who live here year round, and I've lived here year round, for 39 years. Um, so many of us, if there's a storm, even if it's cold in January, freezing, we'll go out to the beaches and just like walk and dance in, in, because the waves are fabulous and the noise and the splashing. And I, I've seen a mother dancing with her little child oh. by, the, by the ocean. It's just exhilarating. And, and I like walking around town. I'm so fortunate. I'm in a little town with perfect little houses and lots and lots of flowers. We want to talk more about the new book, but I just thought about this. Do you and Charlie, have, how, do you have really different writing styles? How do you blend that in your in the one house? Oh, that's a good question. Charlie used to write for Rolling Stone. Right. He, he loves music. It's all about music for him. And then he opened a record store here. And then he closed it down about the time that streaming came along. 
and now he writes uh, he, he's on the board of our local theater dreamland mm -hmm. he writes a column once a week about the dream um he does interviews on our local television which is how i know him. and um and his style of writing and he was just interviewed in Nantucket today. Um, his style, he's a nonfiction person. Mm -hmm. He's, he, he's there and we're, we really balance each other out because he, he can remember who played backup guitar in Aerosmith or something like that. He's mm -hmm. got the memory for the facts and the details. And, um, we respect each other. I think that's that's really at the heart of it. When I first met him, I went to give a talk in somewhere in Massachusetts. It was a luncheon talk, and Charlie came with me, and I told him, Charlie is coming, my husband's coming. And so when we got to the table, it said Nancy Thayer, and next to it said, guest of Nancy Thayer. And Charlie liked that. He liked it. You don't know, you can't imagine how many men would say, I don't want to consider you a guest. I am this important person. And Charlie, Charlie's happy for me when good things happen. And that's, that's what you want in the first meeting. So for your, um, well, coming out next spring, do you have a little, so you've told us a little bit about it, and I think you have a little surprise for our listeners and watchers. Um, do we get to see some cover art today? Um, absolutely. You will, and you are the first people group, and the people who listen to you will be the first people who see the cover art. Um, That's so amazing. I, I love it. I love the cover art. I can tell you this much, there are two young women walking to the beach, and those are my girls. There's Annie, there's Barrett, and they're my, oh, it is such a wonderful thing. I got this once just then. I will never stop loving how the art department makes my people, my seeing, come alive. And the other thing I want to say is that after all the changes I had in my life, I really feel like I found a home with Valentine. Mm -hmm. I've published a lot of books with them. I love my editor. And Allison Schuster and Karen Fink, who are marketing and publicity, and the whole art department, I just, I, they are so capable with what they do. They're so talented and they're so receptive that I feel like you're, I won't say a family, that's too corny and they, they have a lot of other relationships, but I feel very, very fortunate to have this group of people to work with. And when you see my cover, you'll know how, how talented the art department is. And I, I just feel, I finally feel like I'm at home. That's wonderful. And they, I, so I love your, so you're involved with every aspect. I, mean, I know a writer of your caliber is, and, and, but the fact that you're still, you know, so involved with the, with, with the, the art department and involved with the marketing and, and they're, you feel it in your heart that they're, they're hitting it on the, hitting it where you need. That's amazing. Yes. And it was wonderful. Even during COVID, we got to have Zoom conversations and we got to see Allison. I actually was in New York. It's been 10 years, I think. I, I went into Penguin Random House and, and went up to the floor that Shauna has, or Shauna has her office. And um, I met a lot of people. Uh, there was something going on and I was speaking and I met Alan Alda. <laughs> and that was wonderful. Um, but 
I, I need to get down to New York more often. COVID sort of like made it impossible to go anywhere. And yeah. I want to get down there, um, for one thing, to be in New York, <laughs> New York but also to talk to Shauna. Amazing. Well, Nancy, I know we're, we're coming to time, but we, uh, we've loved this conversation. I cannot wait to read your new book, put it in my list, and I'm going to get stepping. Um, I can't believe I haven't read it yet. <laughs> I think it's, you would like that if you're a step, even if you're not a step mom. A lot of it is about being a mother. I found that as hard as, as being a step mom. Children, little children, are yeah. difficult sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. But I love doing this, and I will send you a copy. I'll send you both an ARC, an advanced reader's copy. Uh, Thank you so much. Oh, my God, I feel so special. <laughs> <laughs> that this makes my year. <laughs> Um, but Nancy, thank you so much. Thank you um, so much. Have, a, have a great day. If you enjoyed this episode, subscribe and leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. To stay up to date with In Her Words, join the conversation by following Women in Entertainment on our social channels and subscribe to our weekly newsletter at womeninentertainment.com.